We gave Threadripper a pretty positive review for production tasks. Now we're gonna actually put the thing to real work, not just benchmarking, and show an actual use case for this core and thread count, because depending on what you're doing normally in day to day, you might not be able to find one, but we've got a good one for it, and that is resolving our data crisis. We've talked about this in the past. So right now, thanks to our 4K upgrade and just doing more videos in general, we're doing something like 50 gigabytes a day. We're using about 1.5 terabytes of data a month. I can't afford to buy that many hard drives. So what do we do? You either delete everything, which sucks because I'm paying someone, Andrew, to film that stuff and I don't want to delete work that I've paid for. And the other option is find another solution. So buy storage, don't want to do that. I can't afford a petabyte server like Linus. Or you compress it and you take the uh, approach of building some kind of software or script to compress this data down losslessly as much as possible and then keep it in a much smaller form factor. So that's what we're doing and we will be using Threadripper for that task because it is going to be best for this particular workload. And we'll show more of that as we get through this testing. Before that, this coverage is brought to you by CableMod. Already well known for their work in custom sleeved power supply cables, CableMod is now venturing into liquid cooler tube sleeving with their new AIO sleeving kit, compatible with Corsair and NDXT as of now. Check the link in the description below for more information. So to bring everyone up to speed, the last time we talked about our compression script was probably in December. And basically what it does is it uses the Handbrake CLI. It's a PowerShell script we wrote ourselves and it goes through all of our files, compresses them, uh, and does a couple of other cool things that help us with data preservation while also making a ton of room. So this can save us something like hundreds of gigabytes per day, but the only reason we're not currently pulling that much data back out from uh, being occupied is because we need the system to do Premiere and rendering and video editing, because the same system that compresses everything that does all the editing and daily production. So that's where this comes in. I can't keep Threadripper occupied permanently for this task. So what we're gonna do is build a system, let it compress the 1300 or so files it needs to compress, and then probably after a couple of days of sitting there doing nothing but compressing, we'll be able to reclaim it for other testing and, and articles and things like that. But to give you an idea of the outcome here, we're looking at a reduction of around 80% in the space requirement. So we go from about 1.5 terabytes, 1.4 terabytes, to about 280 gigabytes per month used. Just think about that for a second. That's, that's buying a four terabyte, well, three four terabyte hard drives if I want RAID 5, uh, every couple months, every two to three months, versus compressing all of that and then uh, just being able to use the same drives for years, actually. So that's what we're doing. And we're gonna use the 1950X for that because it's 16 cores, 32 threads, and Handbrake really likes threads. So what I'm gonna do is build this in uh, basically an open air bench. It's the P3, I, I, I'm gonna be putting this on the floor so I do actually need a case, which uh, I normally don't like a whole lot, but we're gonna use this case because it's basically an open air bench. So I need to mount this first. Okay, so we're gonna start with getting the board set up and I'm gonna use the new Noctua coolers that came in just cause they're kind of interesting and haven't worked with them yet. So we're gonna get a chance to actually install one of those. We'll test it very shortly. Uh, this from our testing, mind you, we, we did actually test thermal paste application is gonna be about enough for Threadripper. So before anyone freaks out with the usual, that's way too much, what are you doing? Uh, we actually did do content on the amount that's required to really cover this thing. So here's what we're working with before I install this. This is the TR4. It's an NHU14, I believe, NHU14S. Uh, so it's got a wider cold plate than the previous version. It's a wider cold plate than actually than one of these. This is the Corsair H100i or something, V2. There's your normal cold plate size. So we've got a much bigger cold plate than that. It'll let us contact more area. It's not gonna be a better cooler than a liquid cooler, I don't think. It's possible, but I'm not, I'm, that's not why I'm installing it. I'm installing it because it's gonna be easy uh, and because I don't wanna mount a liquid cooler. So these screws come all pre-installed on the thing. I didn't, I didn't pre-do any of this for the Nocto cooler. And it's kind of like X99 or X299 in that way. It's just got, Screws that mount straight into the socket. You don't need a backplate retention kit because 
it's all on the board as part of the socket. Okay, I don't remember exactly how Handbrake responds to memory, but we're just gonna use this G-Skill kit. G-Skill sent over some extra of this. This is the Trident Z RGB memory, and this particular kit is 3200 megahertz, and it's a CL14, which is actually pretty damn good. So 3200, CL14, 32 gigabytes. I don't know that we're gonna use that capacity with Handbrake, but uh, we'll find out. Okay, so there's our memory. Oh, this, by the way, uh, I, I don't like these covers, so I took it off. <laughs> so I've got an exposed fan there. If you're wondering, that's not how it actually looks. What do we need next? We need the fan for the cooler. Well, that was, that was easy. So, I mean, that was the whole point of installing an air cooler. I'm not sure if it'll beat liquid or not. I don't think it will if we're not concerned about noise and stuff, but we'll save that judgment for the review. What I really wanted to do was avoid having to actually do work and install a radiator in the case. Oh, we need a standoff up there. Oh, this is the actual real reason, by the way, that I took the, uh, the cover over here off. This cover protrudes up and it was interfering with one of our test benches. It's getting in the way. Uh, that might be a problem here, I'm not sure. Damn it, Asus. Okay, so the one problem with this cooler that I'm seeing immediately is clearly we're not gonna use the top slot. Fortunately, it's irrelevant for a number of reasons, one of which is we don't need the top slot. There's three other ones, and this build isn't ever gonna need the top slot, and it's also not gonna be a long-lasting build. The other reason it's relevant is because I'm just gonna install a riser cable and call it a day, because we're not doing anything GPU-intensive anyway, which is why, oh, this is a 1080 Ti. Well, that's, I guess that's why we're putting a 1080 Ti in there. I guess I can make this somewhat presentable. I'm not gonna pull a Paul or Kyle and make it pretty though. I'll tell you guys that right now. The goal of this is to be functional for a few days and then reclaim all the parts. Six plus two PCIe, four plus four CPU. We can't use this power supply. I might not even manage these cables. I might just, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Patrick built this for us as a display system for some B-roll. So it was managed very well, it looks nice. And I'm just gonna come in here, unbuild it all, and then not even manage the cable when I'm done. Okay, that's no good. Oh, that'll work. Supernova 750G2L. The one thing I do like about it is they're all universal connectors, so you just move them around based on where you want them. Like I said, I'm not cable managing this. I'm going to treat this like a test bench. The only difference is it's going to be on the floor standing vertical instead of on our very limited table space sitting horizontal because we need that space for other tests right now. So we're just going to connect everything as efficiently as possible which does not involve making it pretty. Okay, what's left? Drive. Okay. Aren't you gonna mount the drive, Steve? I'll tell you where to put your drive. <laughs> I think we're gonna go with, probably go with right there. That looks, that looks pretty good. All right, that's not gonna move. Got the, Video card, uh, power cables, power cables, times three, power cables, power, memory. Am I missing anything? I think that's it. Other than style and class. Okay, so we just need to make sure this works. Move it into the other room, turn it on and let it compress. Stuff for a little while. Yes. Does it stay booted? <laughs> it's probably gonna power cycle. Yeah, power cycle number one. 
Oh, white LED over here, that means we're good. That one down there. Went from red to white. Take green, okay. So the system works. Now we just gotta set it up to compress everything. So I have some numbers here now that we've had it doing some compressing. We used a test clip to get started and uh, first of all, I had a 4960 in that system originally in the render machine, and that one was completing the transcode in 11 minutes. So that was a 4K file to a 4K output, same frame rate, same pretty much everything, uh, but some reduction in quality on the placebo side. So it looks basically the same, but is a lot smaller. It's 56 to 80% smaller depending on which file it is, how much data there is to compress. So that was 11 minutes. When we upgraded to the Xeon a couple days ago, which we haven't really talked about yet, that's a 12 core, 24 thread part from uh, X79 era as well. And that is doing it in seven minutes. That's a pretty good reduction from 11 to seven. And that allowed us to do something like regain about 50 gigabytes of data every three hours or so. So leaving the script running for three hours, if we're at 50 gigabytes to start, we come back, we've got 100 gigabytes now, we have all the original files uh, dealt with. <laughs> and the new ones are just compressed fairly losslessly. So that was every three hours about 50 gigabytes. And now with Threadripper, the 1950X, we're doing the same test file. Instead of seven minutes, we're doing it in three minutes, 19 seconds. So it's like about half, actually a little bit better than half of where we were with the Xeon 12 core 24 thread part from X79 era. That's also better than the 7900X will do, mind you, not nearly as much, but it is better. And that means that if we assume about half the speed or half the time requirement, I should say, to perform the same task, instead of 50 gigabytes every three hours, we're going to be gaining back 100 gigabytes every three hours. So running the thing overnight means that when we go for, a, uh, let it run for, let's just pick a number like eight hours to make it easy, we're going to be doing a couple hundred gigabytes every night that we can claim back. And because we produce about 50 gigabytes of data on that machine per day, we'll be net positive. So that's good. That means we can turn through the 1300 or so videos, compress them, gain back probably, I don't even know, probably like a terabyte plus of data, I, I should think. I would think it'd be one to two terabytes back for those files. We've got a, a three by four terabyte drive set up on that machine, RAID 5. So I think we should reclaim a couple of terabytes though. So it looks good. Threadripper, the 1950X, this is an actual use case for it. This is something we've wanted to show for a while. When Ryzen came out, we spent a lot of time talking to AMD as did a lot of other folks. And the problem we had there was there wasn't very good communication between the technical people and the people with whom we have contact. That would be like PR or tech marketing. And so the problem you run into is when we say, back when the 1800X launched, what are some use cases for this? Help us out. We can test Premiere, but we're seeing CUDAs faster. So what do we do to Premiere to make sure that you can actually see a difference in CPUs? We test Blender, CUDAs faster. What do we do in Blender to see a difference with CPUs? How do we make these things relevant was the question we were asking. And there weren't a lot of good answers at the time. But now that we've had our own time to work on Ryzen for, what, three or four months now, We've pretty much figured these things out. And this was one of the best real use cases where one, we can't GPU accelerate it, accelerate it in a meaningful way that produces better results. Uh, and we, it's, you just kind of trust the CPU more when you're dealing with compression and then getting rid of the source file. Uh, and two, this thing really uses cores and threads more than a lot of other stuff. Doesn't care about frequency as much, doesn't care about memory as much, doesn't care about the GPU at all. So this is a real world application of what you can do with something like Threadripper, and that's $1,000, and it's better than the 7900X for the same task. So great use case for it. Now, how many people do this type of work? Probably, probably not that many in our audience, uh, but hopefully this opens some eyes as to the question of what the hell do I do with 16 cores? Why do I even care about that processor? Yeah, you see this question, and uh, it's generally because they're not good for gaming. So you look at it, I mean, they can game, but value-wise, it's not a good value. And that's because they're not built for gaming. As we've been saying, they're built for things like this. So this is the real-world use case 
of where you are most efficient with something like a high thread count processor. And uh, of course you use your cheaper stuff for playing games because the value proposition is just so much better. But yeah, hopefully that opened some eyes. As always, you can subscribe for more. Patreon.com slash GamersX to stop us out directly. Thank you for watching this experiment. I'll see you all next time.